Good evening, I'm Alastair Crock. Welcome to the third in our series of extremely minor operas by measurably obscure Italian composers. Tonight we present La Storia Imbecille by Giovanni Battista di Pozzo. In Act One, the Duke, who has usurped his now peasant brother's throne and seduced his half-sister Caterina, contrives against his stepfather, the Archbishop, unrelenting in his pursuit of the Duke's present wife, Lucia, who for her part has eyes only for her brother-in-law's valet, Felatio, unknown to all the actual husband of his daughter's best friend, Cretina, presently lamenting her unrequited love for Caterina's uncle, Testosterone, recently escaped from imprisonment and forced to remain in disguise as Lucia's mother, causing Cretina to reveal it to Astolfo that she is in fact her own niece. In scene two... Psst, psst, what? Well, why wasn't I... <clears throat> I'm sorry, I've just been informed that tonight's presentation will in fact be L'Histoire du Soldat, with music by Stravinsky, performed by the KPFA Radio Symphony with a grotesque travesty of the original script, for which something called Ruby's Drive-In Radio Theatre is apparently responsible. In any event, I'm still Alistair Crock. Our story opens in 2018, the 43rd year of the United States rapid deployment strike in Central America. Young Dexter Fitzkibble is back from his tour of duty patrolling the slightly radioactive shores of Lake Duarte, formerly known as El Salvador. For reasons he has difficulty explaining, Dexter has decided not to re-enlist, despite the inducements of a promised promotion to defoliator first class and a free leather-look designer body bag. Together with the remnants of his unit, he musters at Fort Reagan for the traditional farewell to his comrades in khaki. It's here that we meet for the first and last time the appalling General Frederick C. Crudegobbler. <laughs> Soldiers coming home from war Uncertain just what he's fought for Blowing peasants into bits Has thawed his army's frozen wits stuff, alas. And at the passing out parade, all his thoughts are soon allayed. Persons, war is merely the continuation of work by other means. Every day, you sacrifice yourselves so that this country can turn a profit. I'm going to ask you now to be even more generous with your pathetic kiss-ass lives. Remember, we are facing a barbaric enemy. Over there, if you don't work, you starve. Over there, you have to wait in long lines to get the goods you need. Over there, you are constantly being screwed around by vast, inhuman bureaucracies. Over there, if you go on strike, they brand you as enemies of the people. Sounds like over here. Silence! I hear some of you are bitching about regimentation and the militarization of everyday life. Well, regimentation and militarization have a purpose. For America to win this war, you must learn to stop thinking. Your minds must be empty, alert ready to receive the next order. Otherwise, some Sandinista son of a bitch will sneak up behind you and beat you to death with a sock full of sh- General George S. Patton said that. 
An army is a team. It lives, fights, and fries as a team. In this team, every person has a job to do. Just like the team at the office, the team at the factory, the team at school. Some people have to sweat their guts out and take the risks. Other people have to make the decisions. That's what democracy is all about. We don't want any cowards in this army. They should be squashed like maggots. But there's one thing that's worse than a coward, and that's a traitor. I'm talking about the kind of scumbag that wants to abolish wage labor and government and national frontiers. The kind of pink peddling bum biter that thinks people like you can get together and provide for your own needs without any help from people like me. Myself, I thank God that 30 years from now, when I'm sitting in my shelter with my mutant grandson on my knee, and he says to me, Grandpa, what was the point of the great nuclear war? I'll be able to say to him, Son, the point was not for me to die for my country, but to make some other poor sons of bitches die for my country. <laughs> Young Dexter finds himself abroad in what is still jokingly referred to as civilian life without plans or prospects. For some weeks, with his electronic credit chip still charged with back pay, he wanders in an amiable daze through the colorful, rubble-strewn landscape of early 21st century America. But his few hundred megadollars are soon spent, and he finds himself faced with the necessity of seeking work. Since unemployment is running at 65% and the usual minimum requirement for all but the most menial jobs is a doctorate in computer science, Dexter is somewhat at a loss. One evening, as he crouches glumly in his rent -a cube an accidental movement of his tongue flicks on his old-fashioned Microman AM-FM tooth implant radio. Hmm, what's this stuck to my back tooth? Tastes like a radio. K-H-E-L, San Francisco. Are you a veteran? Have you returned stateside with oodles of stumps on experience bayoneting pinko Latin American peasant women and calling in airstrikes on Adomi grammar schools crawling with eight-year-old revolutionary fanatics trained in Cuba? Have you been trained in the rigorous science of getting high in helicopters and dropping air-to-surface incendiaries on Marxist bean farmers to make their small, dirty country safe for McDonald's and Coca-Cola, but don't know how to put those high-level skills to use? Now you can. At Insecurity Systems, our business is keeping people safe from their own world. A world in which you can't even walk in your own kitchen at night without being raped and mugged by your own relatives. As a vet with frontline combat training, you already know what modern living is all about. You can make our clients think they're safe inside our concrete and barbed wire bunker condominiums while keeping their money safe in your pocket. Call 000 000. That number again, 000. Gee, it sounds like he's talking to me personally. Inspired by the extraordinary felicity of this seemingly personal invitation, Dexter dials the number and is granted an interview. He rushes over to the Insecurity System building without even putting on his sidewalk armor. Hi. Welcome to Insecurity Systems. 
I'm Bill Z. Bub. You must be that timid voice kid I spoke to on the phone. The one who sounded like a talking loaf of fresh white wonder bread soilant. Gee, that's kind of you to say, Mr. Bub. Well, if you want a job here, the first thing you'll have to do is get rid of that fresh sounding voice. We want people who have gooey, moldy, smarmy, green voices like this. Let me hear you say the word safe. Safe? Let's try it again. A little more drippy and oozy. Safe. Safe. Hmm. Well, not bad for the first time. Now let's try this. Crime. 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 A little better, but try to be a little heavier on the M at the end. And try to sound a little more morally outraged, as if you're thinking about politicians on cocaine having sex with your own children. Crime! You know, son, you've got promise. I'm going to take a chance on you. Now then, what kind of security do you want to sell? Gosh, gee, I don't know what kind you got. <laughs> what kind don't we have? Take your pick, son. We have machine gun emplacements for that new deck or rumpus room, an umbrella of radar and electronic countermeasures around your credit cards, computer-guided exocet missiles that can be launched from your car during a traffic jam that skim the ground and can create an opening in seconds, oozy machine pistols that fit into a handbag so your wife can spray the bushes as she jogs in the park at night, crack Israeli anti-terrorist platoons to pick your daughter up at school, heat-seeking anti-shoplifter sea wolf missiles for small inner-city grocery stores, and of course our old standby product, the good old-fashioned ICBM burglar alarm with a photosensitive defense system that shrieks whenever a swarthy-skinned person looks cross-eyed at your property. Immediately, a bank of seven supercomputers activates missile silos disguised as dog houses, and four 20-megaton ballistics missiles creates an envelope of nuclear deterrence around your carport. Wow, but all that must cost you a fortune. How can you afford to provide all those services? We only provide one service, son. Security. Let me hear you say, security. Security. But you mean those people pay all this money to get these systems installed? They don't even work? You mean they get nothing? They get security, son. The security of nuclear deterrence. The customer thinks he's safe, and the customer is always right. So, which do you think you can sell, son? Gee, Mr. Bub, I don't know. They all seem so destructive. Don't you have anything on a kind of a smaller scale? Oh, an old-time pre-Reagan liberal, eh? Well, there's our ghetto line. Bulletproof minority pop star poster diapers for minority babies to protect them from sudden police search and seizure machine gun attacks. Well, it sounds like a good cause. At least I'll be helping poor people. That's right. Think of it, son. You'll be helping minority people fight the brutal racist official policies of this extreme right-wing fascist pig police state we live in. What do you say? I'll do it. Great. Sign right here. Wait a minute. What are these small red letters here? S-O-U-L... Oh, forget about the small print. That's just legal mumbo-jumbo. You can pick up the diapers on your way out. And good luck. Gee, thanks, Mr. Bub. I'll do my best.
Dexter can hardly believe his good luck. Not only is he earning substantial sums, he is able through his work to help the underprivileged victims of police brutality. But once again the devil is lurking in Dexter's path like a sidewalk dog deposit hidden beneath a candy wrapper. As he relaxes in his security lounger one night... Fourteen hundred, fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred, seventeen hundred megabucks for a single day's work! And my commission of 20%, hey, that's a lot of money. And to think I'm doing my part to help poor people survive in a brutal, uncaring world, just like Mr. Bub said. But boy, am I beat. Let's see what's on the tube. The city district attorney's office today announced the opening of an investigation into the alleged slaying of 26 minority children by overzealous police in a crackdown on a consortium of what they described as ghetto-hardened career criminal preschoolers led by a mafia-backed cadre of ex-eraser clappers, grades K through 4. The allegedly felonious toddlers replied to a police order to surrender with a hail of creamed corn, apparently putting their trust in what turned out to be totally dysfunctional bulletproof diapers. Rookie police were reportedly provoked into attacking by the pictures of rich minority pop stars ornamenting the diapers. Criminy! I'm responsible for all those poor children. I need a drink! The DA also is reportedly setting up a committee to consider beginning a study group to prepare a feasibility report on the possibility of opening a grand jury investigation into the alleged negligence of the diapers manufacturer in security systems, provided they can't come up with the cash to stifle the investigation. Holy smokes, they'll be coming after me soon. Jumpin' Jehoshaphat, what have I done? How can I ever live with myself? Oh, I need another drink. I really need another drink. Gee, wizard, out of whiskey! Dexter rushes out into the streets and hurls himself through the doors of the first open admission drinking establishment he sees. By 2 a.m., he has failed to drown his sorrows, but is well on the way to drowning his central nervous system. Just then, a malodorous object collapses next to him and begins emitting sounds. Hey, buddy! Mind if I join you? No, go ahead. You look a little down in the mouth. What are you drinking? Smells like Kiko Mine Sweet and Sour Mash Jim Beam Blended Soy Whiskey. Hey, Joe, give the man another Jim Beam, straight up. Hey, thanks, buddy. So what's bothering you, my friend? Well, I'm a salesman. I, I just found out that so-called bulletproof diapers I've been selling to dozens of helpless little children didn't work. Now I'm responsible for 26 deaths. Oh, you must have been working for insecurity systems. I used to work for them. You did? Yeah. He used to sell mine layers to school teachers to keep the kids off the playground till recess. Then for a while I sold nerve gas to bus drivers to keep people from playing their Walkmans too loud. And then the CIA had us build a napalm marmalade coffee break truck to overthrow the fanatical commie perverts that run Topeka, Kansas. And I realized I couldn't live with myself anymore, so I started drinking. Yeah, me too. You know what you should do? Do what my boss, Mr. Bill Z. Bub, told me to do. Sell your car, sell your house, sell everything you got. That way, you'll always have enough for a drink. You know, I think you're right. At this point, the orchestra plays a melancholy interlude in which the clarinet enunciates the Jim Beam theme.
Some months later, having followed his colleague's advice, Dexter once again finds himself a little short of funds. Gathering the tatters of his bulletproof trousers about his legs and tugging on his rusty anti-mugger hat, he crawls forth into the winter night. There in the distance, through the soy whiskey fumes which have engulfed his brain, he sees, shining like a beacon in a tempest, the luminous words, Dingy Donuts, open 24 hours. Hey! Hey, buddy, can you help me? Can you help me with something? Can you help me with that, with a quarter, or with a dime, or, or anything? Can you just, just a cup of coffee? Can you help me, man? Oh, wow, man. It's like I know where you're coming from, man. It's like I know where you've been, brother. Like, I used to come from that place myself, right? Like, I wish I could, like, totally freaking, like, help you, like, out, man. Like, right? But it's like, whoa, right? It's like, whoa, right? Like, I don't even, like, whoa. Like, I don't even, like, have Yeah, yeah, okay, it, right? okay, like, man, right? look. Okay, look, can you just help me out? Whoa, man. It's like, whoa. It's like you're laying this whole, like, bum trip on me, man. Like, right? Like, okay, like, right? Like, I've been from your space, man. And, like, okay, like, I'm not going to give you any, like, money, man. Because you're just going to spend it on, like, alcohol, man. Which is, like, a totally down drug, man. It's, like, nowhere, right? It's, like, totally, like, right wing. Like, Bob Hope, Donny Osmond, like, Secret Death Squads, like, Covert Operations, like, Dick Van Dyke, like, ba da 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 like good morning. All right, all right, just, just shut up. Look, look, can't you, can't you slip me one of those donuts? Just one, like the, the, the one with the cream filling and the maple drippy oozy jelly meringue. Oh, oh, oh man. That's like so freaking square, man. That's like Lawrence Welk on like Valium, man. Or like David Stockman's shoe tree fetish. But like, I know what you need, man. You need a nice 12 grain wheat germ, like Rocky Road, like lentil bean frosted alfalfa sprout donut, man. It really cleanses you, right? It, like, it'll open up your pores, right? And, it, like, plus it puts your head in, like, a really nice space, Yeah, right? hey, yeah, sure, give me it. Whatever, whatever. Mmm. Mmm. Mm, this is really good. God, I haven't eaten in about two days. Wow, this is great. It's mm. good for you, too, man. It brings your, like, jogging skills up to your, like, third chakra, right? And it cleans up acne on your astral body. And, like, you can even deal with your parents on it, right? Gee, this donut is beginning to look really weird. The cream filling kind of reminds me of Elmer's glue. Ooh, I can feel its heart beating. And the alfalfa sprouts, they form a kind of pattern. I can see the map of Magellan's voyages. No, wait, it's the complete municipal bus routes of Athens, Georgia. It's the entire Andromeda galaxy. Oh, yeah, man. I forgot to tell you, like, the glaze is, like, laced with, like, angel dust, man. You're about to be, like, psychically beamed up to the, like, astral plane, right? When you get back, we got lots more, too, man. We got some Roman germ purple microdot meringue and some spirulina peyote frosted and some, like, blot of butterworms. to the deep purple void. We are cruising on the astral plane at approximately 850 billion feet above nothing whatsoever. Our pilot, Captain Ozzy Sabbath, has asked me to inform you that cosmogenic conditions are excellent and that he expects our flight to be like truly awesome, man. 
We will remain at this height throughout most of the first leg of flight, descending occasionally to buzz public buildings or whiplash the hairs in an accountant's nostril. Once over the ocean of divine bliss, we will be ascending to 45,000 parsecs and remaining at that altitude for approximately nine centuries. And now, if you'll all please remove the vinyl Tibetan Book of the Dead instruction pamphlet from the pocket on the seat in front of you, we can begin our ascent through the nine bardos of spiritual attainment with a short layover in the seventh bardo to refuel and change karmic incarnations. As you can see, the captain has activated the contemplate your oneness with the infinite sign. Please extinguish all earthly desires and attachments, place any deceased fellow passengers in an upright, lock position, and store any deceased family pets beneath the seat in front of you. We are now entering the first bardo, the plane of greasy side orders. If you would turn your attention for a moment to the left side of the aircraft behind the wing, you will encounter your first vision from the beyond. Gee willikers, what is that? Looks like some kind of immense fat woman, thousands of miles wide in a tight apron covered with coffee stains, stuffing a napkin dispenser with millions of mortal souls. <laughs> More coffee, hun? Oh, that's just the waitress at the Woolworths lunch counter of the gods, man. You ain't seen nothing yet, man. As you can see off to your right, we are now entering the second bardo, the plane of urban blight. Good Lord, look at that! Seems to be a horde of gigantic, gleaming shopping carts filled with filthy clothes and small animals roaring across the infinite, being driven by old ladies with rolled-down socks, babbling incoherently. That's just the convoy of the motorized bag ladies from beyond time, man. What plus you think this is? Where you think you're going? Sixty cents. What much you think it is? Golly, what is that thing? Looks like a visor-capped frost giant driving an immense municipal bus with millions of helpless souls in it, trying to pull the stop cord and get off. You're now passing the rude galactic bus driver from the dimension of eternal annoyance. Please try to remain calm. Move back, move back. I'm not going to tell you again. Sixty cent. What'd I say? What'd I say? What'd I say? Entering the fourth bardo, the plain of Palm Beachism. We see in front of the right wing the legion of elderly desk clerks from the Hotel of Deceased Tourists singing tacky Broadway show tunes. I've got you under my, my skin. Good Lord, this is horrible. I hate those songs. I'm not having a good time at all. Can I get off now? Oh, man, we haven't even gotten to the best visuals yet. Check this out. My God, it looks like a gigantic cocker spaniel tail stretching for millions of light years, wafting solemnly across the cosmos. That's the severed tail of the unknown roadkill, man. It's a composite of all the unbaptized souls of all the dogs that have ever been run over in the daytime. It wags once every 15 million years. Heavens to Murgatroyd! That's disgusting! There's squashed eyeballs and kidneys and putrid stale guts hanging out everywhere. Yeah! Get me out of here! Get me out of here! Dexter looks down and observes that he is leaving his body, or rather that his body is leaving him, and what is more, planning to divorce him on grounds of mental cruelty. He pleads with it, but to no avail. As the orchestra now repeats its moody interlude, notice the significant reappearance of the Jim Beam theme of the clarinet, now subtly transformed into the PCP theme. Dexter awakens next morning, somewhat the worse for toxic substances, but aware that his body must have consented to a trial separation after all. In short, rather than being defunct, he is unhinged. 
He looks around at the quaint, antique, psychedelic decor of the donut shop, disentangles himself from the vintage, wax-dripped, cable-drum-style table, and lurches forth into the streets, seeking spiritual clarification. Whew! That donut-induced guided tour of the astral plane was terrifying. And yet, somehow I feel so much more spiritual now. I feel so free, so unburdened of worldly strivings and attachments. I'm through with alcohol and drugs, too. From now on, I'm going to devote myself to spiritual purity and the attainment of cosmic consciousness. Excuse me, brother. Could I speak with you for a moment? Gosh, Rudy. Sure. What do you know about your soul, brother? What do you know about sin? What do you know about muffler installation and vinyl upholstery and brake alignment? I need some work on my Lincoln. Gee, well, of course, not much, I guess. Well, you know, I used to be just like you, brother. Dumb. Ugly. Creepy. Why, I bet you can't even walk down the street without being set upon by angry mobs. I'll bet your own three-year-old son cuts up your meat. I'll bet when you got married, they had to fly in your specially bred meat from Marine World. But you know, brother, I used to be just like that. I had lost my faith. But then I got fooled again. I got fooled again. And you know, brother, I think you're ready to get fooled again. Jiminy Cricket, where do I sign? I am working for 16-year-old Perfect Schlesball. Supreme Reverend Guru L. Long Moon Baba Very Rishi Gui Bunghole Gobs of Money. We're taking up collection from everybody peoples of all worldly possessions and keeping them safe in tech shelter so your consciousness can be free to focus on a higher plane of getting haircut and finding baggy orange pants. Land of Goshen, that sounds spiritual. Sir, before you sign, wouldn't you rather be a spiritual test tube washer in the science of religionology? Wouldn't you rather be a salvaged being? with your dynamics aligned and your ethics in, debugging all the beings who come across your lines? Look at me, a revitalized FSM, on lines, who's winning across all his dynamics. I can put you on purpose. I can be your terminal. Don't you want to be debugged? Don't you want to be audited and move across the bridge and arrive at the postulate? Jeepers, creepers, where do I sign? Would you like to buy this flower and come up to Rainwash Creek Ranch and eat sticky rice and all the flowers we didn't sell? And find out about God and truth and absolute being and how to wash dishes for 1,200 people and how not to be attached to material possessions and how to get them attached by the government for not paying your taxes? Heavens to jeepers, creepers, yes! Excuse me, sir. Have you ever thought about anything? Are you thinking a thought right now? Sakes alive, I guess so. Then you're already a minister praying at the universal fake church. We believe that faith is just believing anything about just about anything. And a church service is just when two or more people get together to do whatever. And a church is just any tax sanctuary that suffers your money to come unto it and sanctifies it from the IRS. Now. Does that sound too mystical for you? Land of Goshen, where do I sign? Hi, I'm taking up a collection for the Jews for Jah Rastafa, and I'm wondering if you can help. What, you can't spare a dollar to buy zigzag mezuzahs for the ghost of Haile Selassie? Criminy! Hi, I'm recruiting for the Gay Moonies for Krishna Computer Dating Service, and I was wondering if... Hi, I'm soliciting donations for Save the Lesbian Mormon Whales for Khomeini Defense Fund. I'm wondering if... Howdy! I'm from the puerile majority, and we'd like to enlist your support. Hello, I'm a member of the Irish Republican Muslims for a Flat Earth Temple, and we're holding a dancegetic policeman's ball, you see. Yes! Yes! Where do I sign? As Dexter goes tramping happily off in his spanking new orange and purple uniform, with his crucifix mandala jingling, and his freshly shaved and lemon-waxed head gleaming in the carcinogenic sunshine, fully converted to as many vapidly leering cults as he can get his grubby little third eye on, the Soldiers' March makes a brief reappearance as the March of the Cult Zombies, thereby taking on, of course, a totally new significance. home from war. What was it he was fighting for? In a land so far away. Why for freedom, that's to say. 
Standard Oils and IBMs, Chase Manhattans and GMs. Freedom to accumulate at a truly splendid rate. Democratically we pick the shoes we're going to lick. Some months later, coming back to the disciple barracks after a hard day of engram purification in the mung bean fields, Dexter is summoned to an audience with his beloved guru, the Supreme Reverend Elron Moonbaba Veri Rishi Gui Bunghol Gabzamani. Alas, he soon discovers that the Reverend wants more from him than merely his toil, his furniture, and exclusive rights to decide the colors of his wardrobe. The Reverend, in fact, desires to penetrate his very soul with hot spurts of divine essence. Dexter flees the ashram conventominium and finds himself once again alone and in need of existential guidance. Or, to put it more crudely, orders. Well, that's okay for you to say. But the fact is, I was getting tired of being pushed around by all those Mahatmas. Excuse me, did I hear you say you were tired of being pushed around? Well, yeah, I did. What's it to you? My name is Mo. Mo Luck. And this is my associate, Ms. Fisto. Mm. Notice the groans of damned souls tortured by the bad puns built into each new satanic sobriquet. You are saying you are tired of being pushed around. Are you tired enough of it to push back? Would you like to start treating most people in the world like the slime balls they are? Are you ready to skate on scum? Gosh, willies, I sure am. No, you're not. You couldn't kick a one-armed Betsy Betsy doll down a steep flight of stairs. You deserve to be abused. You are one of nature's dish rags. Well, um... Dexter. Uh, De Dexter Fitzgibble. Well, Dex, she's got a point there. You are kind of a pustule, aren't you? Hey, now listen, buddy. Here, I don't have to stand Oh, kind of stop your pathetic sputtering. Come, Mo. We are wasting our time with this wretched creature. He will never become an ESS graduate. What? What's an ESS graduates? What do you, what do I'm you glad you asked me that, Dexter. ESS graduates are people who've mastered envy science. People who've reached their full appearance manipulation potential. People who know that for them to get on top, someone else has to get on their elbows and knees on the bottom. People like me, just take a good look at me. What do you say? Well, I see... I'll tell you what you say. You see a deep, perfect tan, immaculately white teeth, gold-plated combination two-way wrist TV, microcomputer and personal defense system, hand-tailored bulletproof Harris Tweed suit, credit cards hooked directly into numbered accounts in an air-conditioned Zurich bomb shelter, and you envy me, don't you? Well, I suppose... Of course you do! And what's more, you suspect I have the entry codes to Ms. Fisto's intimacy zones. Doesn't that sting even more? You would like to access me sexually, but you're not mad enough to do anything about it. Besides, you failed to meet my minimum standards. You wear the poor man's cologne. Honest, disgusting eau de toil. The reek of submission is all around you. But you want her all the same, don't you? Well, she sure smells good, still. I... That's right. Unfortunately for you, though, your nostrils don't even reach my ankles. But you could have a Dex. You could have women twice as envy-inspiring. You could stride through the world like a god, Dexter, shuffling everyone in your path. That sounds keen. What do I have to do? First, you have to admit you're a nebbish. You are used bubblegum the world has scraped off its shoe. But Envy Science Seminars can clear your personal dominance channel, Dex. No. You're too feeble to stand up to the seminars. You'd snap like a stale baguette. Come on, Zimo. Let's go and revel in our superiority. No, no, wait a minute. Where do, where do I sign? Later, in a glitzy restroom at the local Hyatt Fortress Inn... Let me tell you a secret. All the billions of abused, exploited, oppressed wimps in the world are that way because they like it. So don't feel sorry for them. They have chosen a life of groveling misery for themselves, just like you. And the rest of us have chosen to kick you around. It's one or the other. You see, trainees, it all comes down to zero. Zero is the key concept of envy science. You think we're going to teach you how to look after number one, right? Wrong. We're way beyond number one. We're going to teach you how to look after number zero. Divide a number by zero, and what do you get? Uh, That's right! You can't do it! 
Because life is a zero-sum game, my friend. What you gain on the swing, someone else loses on the roundabouts. And zero is all you are, trainees. Worthless, empty, a great big nothing. The hole in a non-existent donut. You still looking after number 452. Hey, speaking of donuts, Mo, you look familiar. That's right, Dex. Shut up. You see, that zero you are is full of potential. Because nothing is the purest potential there is. Your nothing is waiting to be filled with envy. Other people's envy. You'll achieve personal dominance by appearing to be what everyone else thinks they want to be. And what you merely think you want to be. You only came here because you were hot to be insulted by an unattainable Teutonic sex goddess. You do not want to be members of the super elite. But I tell us he's wrong, Trainers. No! no! Very well. You, Fiskibble, stand up. You are so full of the toxins of outworn morality that your eyeballs are brown. The illusions of compassion and brotherhood have filled your brains with mud. We will now try water therapy. Trainees, back into your stalls. Receive the pleasures of the flush! Some 16 hours and 250 gallons later. Oh, that's all I can give. Are you sure? I've got to be certain all the archaic ethical poisons are out of you. I'm sure. I'm sure. Can I please come out now? All right. Come out, dumpster. You're a graduate. You know, I feel much stronger now. I'm no longer a used dish rag. I feel even enviable. I think I'm ready to take on all the women I see. I think I'm even ready to take on Miss Fisto. I feel all powerful. I can leap off a bridge and hang suspended in midair. I can leap over tall sex goddesses with a single bound. I'm Superman! Dexter goes forth from the Envy Science Training Seminar, a fully qualified graduate, emptied of archaic ethical hang-ups and ready to squeeze the opportunity trigger and fire the pistol of prosperity at whoever gets in his way as the orchestra now takes up the march of the rigidologists. <laughs> Thank you. 
personal dominance channel, guide Dexter to an upwardly mobile carnivorous plant bar where caviar night is in full swing. Hi there. Tried the mock beluga yet? It's made out of plankton, but it's really quite good. Mmm, what's that you're wearing? What'll you pay to find out? Oh, you've just been through envy science seminars, right? Uh, yeah, how'd you know? Hey, I wouldn't mind getting some hands-on experience with your confidential material. <laughs> you're sweet. But you know, the problem with rigidology is it's all talk and no action. I went through ESS years ago. Still, it does help you get on the right track. Anyway, I'm Lucy. Lucy Fur. Oh. So tell me, what do you do for dividends, cute stuff? Me? Oh, well, well, I'm looking for a, a low overhead, high yield, uh, independently owned investment opportunity. Something to grow with. I was thinking maybe a mobile Krill Burger concession chain outside torture parlors. Why not think property, hon? Has a nice sound to it, huh? Property? Do you know how easily you can lay hands on distressed property through government repo auctions? Uh, uh no, that is, well, uh, well, of course, yeah, I, uh... First, you buy yourself a patch of ghetto from some over-mortgaged small-time slumlord. Take on the mortgages, pay pennies on the dollar to your source for the down payment, then get a federal urban confinement department rehabilitation loan. See, you tell the feds it's going to be a wrinkle farm. A what? A convalescent hospital. And after they've paid you to fix up the joint, which you do on your own but itemize it like ten union guys were doing it for you, you get them to pay you the rent through the social security checks the old geezers have to cough up every month to stay there. Neo, huh? Golly jeepers, I didn't know you could make money from dying people. You don't know the half of it, sweetie. Listen, one of my old folks' homes is just a few minutes away. Care to hop in my Nissan Roadkiller Sports Co. and buzz over for a look? Holy jeepers, I'd love to. Shortly thereafter, in a charmingly decrepit neighborhood near the abandoned San Demento nuclear reactor... This whole area has fantastic possibilities. Up to now, it's been zoned for misdemeanors, but they're changing the classification to K-4. That means greed of his bodily harm and up. And that means bunker-style apartment complexes with acid moats and underground garages for the armored personnel carriers. Totally enclosed high-rise weapon malls. We could be getting in on some really hot options. But let me show you around. Cream and leapers, Juicy. I'm, I'm Lucy. Uh, hey, I really appreciate you offering me the partnership. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, I know I deserve it, and there's really no other choice you could have made. Say, this is a fantastic place. <laughs> You're sweet. You know, we've got this reptile palace almost up to code now. Come over here. Let me show you our pride and joy. The Gerontomat! What's a Gerontomat? It's a facility that provides automated life support services to long-term comatose patients. A vegetable crisper. Just look at them all lying there. Peaceful, isn't it? Why is that little man sitting over there in the corner with that big bag of coins? Oh, that's Mr. Globowitz. He's tanning the coin-operated iron lung his wife is hooked into. Listen. Please deposit $25 for the next five minutes. See, with automated life support systems, we cut costly medical personnel down to the bone, and the machines are worth their weight in plutonium in tax depreciation alone. Mrs. Globowitz is uh, one of our flat lines. Flat lines? Yes. Look, there, on the EEG brainwave readout. A flat line, see? Uh, but why are they still keeping her alive? Because our highly trained counselors guilt tripped their relatives into paying for it. Mrs. G is 123 years old this November, and she's been a total loss from the neck up for the last 47. It's almost miraculous what medical technology can do nowadays, isn't it? Oh, golly, Willikers. Here comes someone down the hall in an awful hurry. Oh, Miss Fur, thank God you're here. I'm out of $25 coins for the machine and the change dispenser here. Won't take my mega buck bill, because it's too wrinkled. Sorry. I wish I could help you, but I never carry cash. 
Listen, sir, how about you? You got change for a mega buck, kill a buck even. The machine's gonna cut my motor off in just a few seconds. Please, can't you help Gee, me out? Let's see, I don't I don't think so. Let me see if I No, no, I'm sorry. Hey, miss, please, Miss Fur, can't you do something? I come in here with two shopping bags full of twenty-five dollar bits just yesterday, and now they're all gone. See, look damn bill will go in the machine. Come on, hurry up. Go in there. Look the red lights flashing. Please please, please. deposit twenty five dollars oh, oh for the next Five minutes. Oh, please, Miss Fur. You have twenty please, seconds. Please, please do something. I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do. You understood our policies when you signed the oh, agreement to have oh your dear. mother cared for here. We can't take responsibility for your lack of preparation. Twenty-five dollars, please. You oh. have... Ten seconds. Oh, no. Can't you just make a little exception just for once? Let's see, this damn bill won't go in the slot. Twenty-five it's, it's dollars. crumpled. See, there the corner. Now, going, going. Oh, I've almost got it in. Gone. It's gone. <laughs> I'm sorry. Your relative has been disconnected. Oh, no. I can't believe this. I, is it, is it, is it, Take it so hard, Mr. Globowitz. Your mother lived a long and happy life, even if her last years were a bit sedentary. Perhaps this was just someone's way of telling you it was time to say goodbye. As the automatic tow truck hooks up to Mrs. Globowitz's bed, <coughs> Dexter and Lucy stare deep into each other's eyes, locked in glowing vistas of centrally located five-acre lots suitable for immediate commercial leasing. And like a diapason to Dexter's joy and his financial and romantic blessings, the orchestra breaks into the vigorously opportunistic strains of the march of the real estate agents. <laughs> Now for the 
And now for the gratuitous <coughs> sex scene. Oh, Dex. What do you say we merge our holdings? 0.3% prime rate. Debenture collateral. High yield. <laughs> Low overhead. What firm <laughs> assets? Oh, you've got such tight money. Oh, Dex. <laughs> I'm going to liquidate. You're going to make me foreclose. <laughs> down and I'll be top dog. I'm the tax assessor and you're the real estate mogul with lots of criminal ideas.
Dexter's happiness is once again short-lived. President Tatum O'Neill, former child star turned senile Republican businesswoman, abolishes Social Security in a fit of pique. The bottom drops out of the government-subsidized geriatric care business. An awkward scene ensues. I'm sorry, Dexter. I just can't get excited by a man whose holdings have gone soft. Dizzy with grief and bankruptcy, Dexter wanders through the bullet pox streets, heedless of the normal ebb and flow of city life. The gangs of infantile delinquents cruising the sidewalks in their hopped-up strollers. Where Ness and his men surround the warehouse where Bugsy... Psst! there, Croc, not Walter Winchell. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'll read that again. Dizzy with grief and bankruptcy, Dexter wanders through the bullet pox streets, heedless of the normal ebb and flow of city life. The gangs of infantile delinquents cruising the sidewalks in their hopped-up strollers, the roving bands of demented bag managers displaced by office automation, and overhead the dreaded sky pilots, airborne fundamentalist hit squads scanning the city below for signs of political deviancy or illicit pelvic undulation. To all this, Dexter is oblivious. His long series of misfortunes has begun to instill in him the wholly irrational conviction that malevolent forces are out to destroy him, but he is being spied upon and is in terrible danger. And as so often before, the father of lies is on hand to exploit his confusion. <sighs> Guess you can't trust anybody. It's every man for himself, and don't sit with your back to the open door. Hey, 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 buddy, buddy, come here. Can I let you in on a secret, huh? What's that? You know who runs everything? The barbershops. That's right, the barbershops. They put little babies in jars. Sure, you didn't know? They shot Bobby Kennedy. They made him into crunchy peanut butter. Shh, shut up, here they come. Who? Shh, the dry cleaners. They put my uncle in a jar, and then they poured him into the fruit punch at a fundraiser for Jane Fonda's martinization work. They tried to put me into a pastrami sandwich, but they found out I'm King Hussein, so they let me go. Shh, shut up. Here they come. You never saw me, right? I gotta go. Bye. Holy Murgatroyd. Could he be telling the truth? The barber shops. Who'd have guessed it? The dry cleaners. I guess you can't trust anybody nowadays. I better be careful. You know, my friend, the hour of reckoning is upon us. The hour when the great locust and anchovy pizza comes down from the sky. But you didn't want anchovies. No, hold the anchovies, you said. Heavy on the mozzarella, you said. But this one doesn't come from pizza hovel, does it? Well, I guess not. Maybe if I just got a plain cheese. Hey, Benny, you better not let the government see you walking down the street like that. They'll take everything. They'll take your checks. They'll take your babies. They'll take your panties. They'll take your brains. They'll take everything and leave you locked in a cabinet with two scorpions and a copy of Us magazine. They've done worse. Golly, gosh, I never thought about that. I guess you're right. I better watch out. Maybe this gentleman will help me. Sir, sir, could I speak to you? <laughs> They're watching you, you know. <laughs> what do you think they're doing there in a hot car with an electronic hot dog, punching the buttons on the fake radio trying to find Tom Mix in Moscow? Why do you think they got nerve gas under the seat, poison sweet and low in the glove compartment, neutron bombs disguised as hubcaps in the trunk? Really? Sakes the gee willikers, I didn't realize. This is awful. Jiminy, gosh gollies, what'll we do? 
Soon, Dexter begins to hear other voices, even when he is alone with his tooth radio switched off. I'm talking about a life-changing experience. It smells April fresh. Business computers that let people communicate. Get a little closer. My boss was right. That's why she's yes, the boss. Yes, Mary, I understand. What is this being? Can we see him? Can we hear him? You need ammonia strength D cleaner. Dope addicts of indefinite sex. In the name of Jesus. Twice as nice. Join the copy achievers. Cause I believe in me. Ooh, ah, exciting. Financing. User-friendly single communication. Single 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 pressure value. Cleaner. Cleaner. You want it? We got it. You want it? We got it. We got it. We got it. One calorie. But wait, before you answer, there's more. Dexter's household computer turns him into the mental health authorities, and soon two smiling droidalies are trundling him away to Mount Latex Schizoiatric Hospital, formerly known as New Jersey. Oh, I feel awful. Must be those injections they gave me. But at least I'm safe from the dry cleaners in here. Welcome to the loony bin, Sonny. Who are you? You're not involved with the chiropractic takeover conspiracy, are you? Why are you wearing those weird purple lights on your fingertips? Oh, snap out of it, sonny. Those paranoid hallucinations filled me with ennui. As if there wasn't enough ennui around here already. See, your paranoid trip is just a flip side of the American dream. What are you talking about? Who are you? Pardon me. Forgot my man as I've been in this dump so long. I'm Bubbles DeBorge, and you are Dexter Fisk Kibble. How do, Dexter? How'd you know my name? Cause it on your digital forehead ID tattoo, fool. Just like mine is. Anyhow, like I say, from the moment you old enough to listen, they be telling you that all your problems is personal problems. Like you in here cause you just can't cut the muscle, right, sonny? Right. Wrong. See? The notion that this is all you leads to exaggerated idea of your own importance. That way, when you down there with your head stuck deep in the garbage can of failure and despair, you got two choices. Either the rest of you belongs in there with the ten-day-old macaroni salad and the second-hand Kleenex, or else you is really the long-lost reincarnation of Elvis Presley and a super-secret alliance of android Freemasons and Zionist whales is after your ass, and that's why you is such a mess. Cause one way or the other, it all down to you. That's right. That's just what I always thought. No, you didn't. When you was a kid, you knew a lot of the stuff grown-ups was handing you was jab. You wasn't born stupid. Hardly anybody is. It took a lot of time and effort to make you as dumb as you is now. Of course! The conspiracy with their satanic microwave rock and roll mind control beams! Dexter, I told you once, and I ain't gonna tell you again. There ain't no conspiracy. At least not how you means it. There's a system. So who runs the system? Is it the Rosicrucian winos for a better Hitler? The Black Pope or the KGB? Please, tell me! That all depend on where you are. But it don't really matter. 
They all the same, honey. Whole white fellas with eyes like burn holes in the postry. But they don't own it. It own them. They just the super duper slaves. Then we go on down the ladder to the regular super slaves, the upper middle slaves, the middle middle, lower middle, lower lower, and finally the used up and thrown away slaves like you and me. I, I wasn't a slave. I was an independent businessman. Dexter, I ain't got the energy to explain to you, so I'll just ask you. What decide at any given time will you go make a profit your big old hairy chest independent business? Why, the free market, of course. The invisible hand of the market where everyone's free to buy and sell for the best price they can get. Riding the great wondrous whirling carousel of opportunity round and round and That's round. That's right, Dexter. Shut up. That's who your boss was, democracy. That's what tell the whole system what to do. Let's put it this way. The big old invisible hand of the market just keep on slapping you upside the head. And that's why you is such a dingbat. Holy creeping Jiminy's! I can feel it now. A huge hand touching me all over. Poking me. I can't stand it. Stop assaulting it, honey. Oh, they going to give you so much catatonia cocktail that a full micro coffee table going to look right lively next to you. Y'all want to know what they tell the market what to do? <laughs> okay, tell me. Well, I ain't going to. Because it all got to do with the circulation of capital and the productivity of social labor and other stuff what going right past you, honey. But I'll tell you what make it all go. That is, I will if you sit up straight and stop trying to stick your elbow up your nose and your toe in your ear. There, I knew you could. What make it all go is you, Doiky. You and all the other slaves on the slavery go round. It go, cause you go to work and go to the store and go to the movie and go home and go to sleep. So you're always ready to go again tomorrow. And just in case any of you gets out of line, the super slaves got places like this one ready and waiting. I know, honey. I was in the general strike in all time street boogie in 1988. Golly, say to Rudy. So what happened to that? Well, they told each half of us that the other half give up. Then after that, they passed the Appetite Protection Act and set up the U.S. Department of Isolation and Office of Triviality Maintenance. And then they done put me in here. But just the same, if all of you stop, you don't go. And then we all could do something more rewarding. Fitzkibble Dexter, Fitzkibble Dexter, Dexter Fitzkibble, come to a white courtesy patient restraint unit, please. Please get into an ambulatory space around getting into a feedback confessional with your reprogramming pastor. Well... Sayonara, Dexter. Don't let on you know nothing, or they gonna replace your cerebral cortex with designer Nogahide. Nurse-tron is outputting, and is quickly ambulated by the restraint unit along many gleaming corridors, up innumerable elevators, past what once Asbury Park, Teaneck, Tenorfly, and Hohocus, until at last he is deposited in scripting space RD-443, level 249Z Alpha, human potential wing 12. As the automatic door whips open before him, he glimpses a brass plate inscribed with the words, Dr. Inferno. Oh. Hello, Dex. Or Hi, or howdy, or what's happened. Whatever greeting energy you feel safe in. What? Thanks for admitting your need for more information. It shows you can be vulnerable. Can you put out any more feeling stuff about your expectations around our interaction? 
Oh, well, I don't know what to expect. We just started talking. <laughs> Very perceptive comment on our process. I hope I'm not overstroking. Overstroking? Thanks for feeding back. I feel like getting into some content. Can you output any permitting stuff around facilitating a dialogue about being clear about some of the issues coming up for you around dialoguing? We, uh, we're, we're, we're having a dialogue, aren't we? Dexter, I'm with you in that place where you want to continue to make process comments. But I think at least some of that is coming out of your fear that it's not safe here to disclose heavy feeling issues because you're afraid I won't validate your sexual fantasies about certain super strong yet super vulnerable human impotential schizoiatric authority figures. No, no, I'm sorry. This isn't making any sense at all. Can we try being a little less linear and judgmental? Dexter. I'm hearing what's coming up for you around your fears that I may violate the boundaries you need to protect that space where you deal with issues around the negative energy that depowers your own permission for yourself to ask for supportive modeling from me to validate your fantasies about your stuff getting stroked. But can you share some quality input with me around empowering that dynamic to reprogram your issues about privatizing the process of getting behind your denial that you're stroking your script? I am not stroking my script. See what I mean? Stroking my script? I don't even like my script. I get all these great one-liners like Gosh Rudy and Golly Gee Willikers. Makes me sound stupid. Then why is so much anger coming up for you around your denial that you're stroking it? Well, I, I just... Uh, you! Dexter, relax. I don't mean to violate your limits around disclosing stuff from a private space. Let's get into more of a healing place and just share some information around the actuality of our interaction. How did you first find yourself resourcing us? Well, I was dragged here by the brain police, kicking and screaming about these horrible monsters I thought were out to kill me and suck out my skull. Can you get in touch with any other stuff around these beings? Yes, they're hideous living columns of smoke, with long slimy tentacles covered with gooey suckers and broken glass and came into my house and chopped down on me and tried to vacuum out my brain. Have you tried sharing your anger with them? Sharing my anger? I have to smash them and kick them and claw them to stay alive. What about coming from more of a caring place? Is it that hard to get into some of the feedback they're sharing with you about their needs in your interaction? Look, Doc, they're not real, are they? I mean, I know I'm crazy. I know they're just hallucinations. And I want to be sane again. But they're not really there, are they? Dexter, I don't want to invalidate your experience, especially when you're so obviously deeply invested in it. That would be coming from a really judgmental space, deprogramming the script you're modeling for yourself. You mean, you mean those terrible, hideous monsters that follow me around are, are real? You're responsible for creating your own reality. What's coming up for me here is that you're afraid to own your responsibility for creating your own world. I created this? <laughs> Thanks for putting out what's coming up for you around that information. Is anything else coming up for you around it? Yeah, no, but it's coming up for you around your shoes. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. I think I know where your feedback is coming from. I feel like I'm more in touch with some of the content you've been outputting. And I also feel we should move into more of an open, validating space. Yeah, but I have just one question. If I'm responsible for creating this nauseating world, and everyone else is responsible for it too, and my hallucinations and demons are real, and everyone else's hallucinations and demons are real, doesn't that mean that everybody's crazy? Dexter. There's an oddness in your head, so I'm substituting mine instead. Exchange your agonizing rap for scientific sounding crap. Voices that you used to think were gods, psychiatry has proven to be outworn frauds. I'll tell you when you're well and when you're not, and when you've paid, it's your own normalcy you bought. In this terminal spirit rot, psychiatry is all you've got. Following his release from Mount Latex, 
Dexter rapidly completes his recovery and resumes a normal life. He becomes an apprentice surveillance systems technician and is soon earned enough to be able to move out of his cardboard box and into a somewhat less spacious but well-armored apartment cylinder equipped with a preachermatic and a <clears throat> 24-hour porno vision. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm not used to narrating this sort of thing. As a matter of fact, I only took this job because I'm between assignments with Masterpiece Theatre and I've got problems with the second mortgage on my chateau in the south of France. Well, <coughs> still, better get on with it. Um, despite access to ever more expensive personal defense equipment, including a man-trapped commute suit for wearing on public transit and increasingly sophisticated sex surrogates, such as his slurperama fold-away love droids, Dexter... I'm sorry, this is appalling. I simply cannot go on. You see, I'm used to narrating classic sagas of Lancashire cotton mill owners and, and pre-war Catholic aristocrats. I'm accustomed to an atmosphere of culture, of refined English nostalgia. Th this isn't my sort of thing at all. I mean, damn it all, I stand for something here. My name is synonymous with taste and breeding in this country. I, I represent the kind of life the average middle-aged American executive or college professor would like to have lived. A world where people knew their place. I can't be associated with this kind of thing. I'm leaving. Alistair, we're almost through. Don't leave. Look, here in the score, there's, there's only a couple more pages. No. Well, shan't. No, no, no. Come on, Alistair. We'll give you a lollipop. Promise? I promise. No more of that ghastly sex stuff? No, no, it's all quite normal from here on out. Oh, very well. <clears throat> Dexter's life becomes increasingly ordinary and humdrum. So humdrum and ordinary, in fact, that he frequently falls asleep in a very normal way while watching Holovision. One such normal evening as he snoozes humdrumly. Dexter, it's Dr. Inferno, Dexter. Here's your script, Dex. I want you to come from a permitting space around validating everyone's energy. The military, the corporations, the criminals, the paranoids, the profiteers. I want you to get into a vulnerable place for them. 
so you can share some positive stuff around empowering their script and really getting behind their needs. I gotta permit the military space, validate the paranoids, put their script in a vulnerable place. Dexter, Dexter, I'm offering you a chance to invest in the greatest phlegm factory in history. A 400 million tent Geronimat Xanadu! We'll keep people alive hundreds of years beyond recognizability. Now the first thing I want you to do is price some ICBM systems so we can start clearing out the state of Pennsylvania. Go to the store and buy some IBC, IBM and, and take 400 tents to Xanadu. Dexter, I want you to bend over and tie your nose to your big toe. I gotta bend over, tie my nose to my big toe. But do I use a shoelace or a piece of string? Dexter, this is your guru, Erron Moon Baba Gopsamani. I want you to lock yourself in a bait and tackle shop for 40 days and focus on all your spiritual energy on your third gallbladder until you feel the bile of God back up and spew out of your fifth chakra. I think there's a bait and tackle store on 3rd Street, but I don't know if they have gallbladders. Psst. Hey, you want to have lots of friends? Friends. Tell you what you do. Take off all your clothes and run out into the street yelling, Kiss me, I'm a horse. Kiss me, I'm a horse. Well, I can't run that fast. Couldn't I be a pony instead? Don't listen to them, Dexter. They just want to make a fool of you. Listen to me, Dexter. Listen to me. Yes? I want you to sell our new insecurity system. It's a transcontinental brainwave radar and electronic countermeasure umbrella that spans the entire Western Hemisphere. As soon as it senses anyone in the country thinking a thought that might be construed as remotely indicative of a prior familiarity with quasi-communistic materials, it activates half a million heat-seeking four-megaton bombs cleverly concealed in the stale grains of rice used inside salt dispensers on hot days at tacky American restaurants. What I want you to do, son, is to test the device by leaving your rice out for a while, installing the warheads, and then glancing quickly sideways the back cover of Lenin's State and Revolution. No! No! No, don't make me do anything more. No, I, I don't want to sell anything. No, no, let me go. Don't let them give you none of that job, honey. You must have been working for an insecurity system. No, no, I don't work for them. They're insane. No, let me, let me go. Shut up, dicks. Now listen up. I want you to get some people magazines. I want you to rip out all the photos of the average man on the street. I want you to make a mountain out of them in your rumpus room. And I want you to get some skis and some goggles. And I want you to slalom on slime. I can't make me. No, I won't. I don't want to think. I want to think for myself and paint pictures and swim in real water. I don't want a prepackaged lifestyle. You want it? We've got it. You want it? We've got it. Hurry while supplies last. I want to run naked through the magnolia blossoms without a single credit chip to my name. You tell him, child. I want a world where there's no psychobabble, no advertising, no poor slobs trying to crawl their way up. You rolling now? A world where people haven't forgotten what makes life really worth living. A world beyond power structures and money. Oh, Lordy, you done it now, child. Look out, it's coming down. Insecurity system. Look out for number one. If you don't sell your time, how can you buy your leisure? You are one of nature's outhouses, you slug. Oh, man, like, try it, right? No, I just... no, no, you can't make me stop. No, I oh. oh, I must have been dreaming. Why am I glad that it was only a dream? All those weird people telling me what to do. Fitzkibble Dexter, Fitzkibble Dexter, please report to a white courtesy medication dispenser for your Placidil, Limpium, Numbutal, Stupazine, Blancol, Bovanil, Mortazine. Bad Amal, dream, Adrenal, eh, Dex? Do you feel like coming from a sharing space about processing some of that negative input? <laughs>
You've just heard Stravinsky's The Tale of the Soldier with a text written and performed by Igor's Drive-In Radio Theater. Kent Nagano conducted the KPFA Radio Symphony. The role of the announcer was played by Adam Cornford. The various devils, Bill Z. Bug, the hippie devil, Moloch, Dr. N. Ferno, the drunk, the rude bus driver, the fooled again Christian, the perfect sleazeball disciple, the religionologist, the universal fake church member, the Jew for Ja Rastafa, the gay Mooney, the talking iron lung, and three male paranoid schizophrenics were played by Michael Pepe. The newscaster, the flight attendant, the rigidologist, Ms. Fisto, the real estate agent, Lucy Fur, the female street wacko, and the black situationist bag lady, Bubbles DeBoard, were played by Melinda Gebby. The soldier was played by yours truly, Terry Hawkins. Members of this morning's ensemble include violinist John Caston, double bass player Tim Spears, clarinets Diana Dorman, bassoon Carla Wilson, trumpet Neil Rosengarten, trombone Mark McConnell, and percussionist Ward Spangler. The engineer for this broadcast was Jim Bennett with production assistance by Monet Holmquist. This concludes our series of live concerts by the KPFA Radio Symphony. If you've enjoyed hearing these broadcasts, please let us know. The KPFA Radio Symphony is made possible in part by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts and co-sponsored by the Berkeley Symphony. For KPFA, this is Terry Hawkins.